you for tuning in to the Comeback Podcast. Today's guest is Stony Brook University's new Assistant Vice President and Dean of Students, effective July 12, 2021, Dr. Rick McClendon. My name is Melanie Formosa, your host. This show is sponsored by the School of Communication and Journalism and the Center for Excellence in Learning and Teaching. Our purpose is to start a countdown to our hopeful return to normalcy following this past year's pandemic. We'd like to lead you into the fall with a weekly update on how we feel, look, and think about tomorrow. Thank you, Rick, for joining me. Thank you for having me. Good to be here. Welcome to Stony Brook. Yes, it's exciting. (laughs) What made you decide to pursue Stony Brook out of any place you could work at? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, with any job search, you start with, where am I going in life? What is my calling? Um, And when I came across the advertisement for Stony Brook, I did my research. Um, I wanted to learn how diverse the community is. Um, I wanted to know how engaged students are in campus life, how rigorous the academic programs are. Um, And what really sold me is talking to employees um, on the campus. Uh, So through the interviews, uh, learning about the culture, learning about student engagement activities, um, learning just what life is like around this area, uh, made it feel like a second home. You talked about the diversity aspect of it, and and that's what made me come, that's one of the reasons made me come to Stony Brook, because it's almost like its own little city. Oh, yeah. Different than Long Island. (laughs) 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 Yeah, so I read your bio, um, and I was very impressed. You've worked at so many colleges. I mean, George Mason University, Shenandoah, Colgate, Western Carolina, everywhere. (laughs) How has, of course, they're all different, right? But how have you seen a general trend in all of the universities that you've worked at? Yeah, I I think the trend is more focused on student success. Um, We understand that students are trying to find their way in the world. Um, They want to be successful, whatever college they choose. And I think the trend has been how do we provide the right resources? Um, How do we provide the right financial means to support students uh, as they're looking to find out and make their mark in the world. And so I think that trend is, uh, is involving students in that process, um, putting them in the driver's seat to create their own education, their own experiences. Um, and, and that's why I stay in higher education is because students get a voice. They get to be a part of that process. How do, you, how do students become successful? Yeah, I, I think it starts with defining oneself. You know, what, what do you value as a person? Um, what do you want to contribute to the world that you live in? What kind of world do you want to live in? And I think through building relationship with, you know, your other colleagues, with professors, um, that's when you really get to start to figure out who you are, what you want to become, and how to make that mark. So to be successful is about starting with self. Um, and then you can kind of take action to create community amongst those people. Um, And then through that community process is when you can then get involved to execute and implement things, ideas that you have. That's so true. Self is forgotten about. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Especially for me. I'm always looking at the outside, what other people want me to do or what Mm -hmm. they recommend, mentors, advisors. Oh, yeah. And, you know, a lot lot of it's driven by what we see our parents doing or the people who are guardians. Um, They somehow have a life and we see and we think, oh, maybe that's what I'm supposed to do. Um, And we never really get a chance to figure out who we are, um, to figure out what our contributions can be. And I think college is a great place to do that is figure out self, um, what we value, what we want to contribute, and then participate in that process. I agree. And also, I think the idea of success is is kind of warped. I mean, what is success? Money, right? That's (laughs) prestige. That's what people think success is. Titles and everything, you know. And it's not, It's not. It really isn't. And I think when when somebody can look in the mirror and say, I am the person I want to be, that to me is success. Um, I'm contributing to a, a community much larger than myself. Yes, I'm taking care of self in the process, but who am I impacting? What value do I bring to the collective community, the collective team that I'm on? Um, and I, I, I appreciate when students can be a part of that process. You were a student once, mm-hmm. and now you're working in higher education. Yeah. How have your experiences as a student impacted you now? Yeah, I, I think for me, um, as a student, I was always a student advocate, you know, working in our residence hall association as president, working as a chief of staff in student government, um, various different boards and whatnot. So it really built my leadership skills, um, not just for my purpose, but how does my skill sets help others? 
you know. Um, and so I've really appreciated and every job I've had, whether it be in the hospitality industry or higher education, it was always about service to others in that process and making those experiences for others who come to my city and town or those who are at my universities. I was going to say, you, you got your bachelor's in hospitality. Ah, yeah, yeah. Did you think you wanted to go into that or, or did you just gain the skills? How, how did that work? Yeah, so I went to a technical high school um, and in 10th grade is when I transferred to this, this high school and it had a built-in hotel, like front desk lobby, hotel room. Um, we, could, we, we got to practice. That's pretty cool. You know? Yeah, and then they said, okay, now that you practice in the classroom, now let's go to an actual hotel. And the people who you got to work with, the people who came to visit the hotels, um, it was just an amazing experience. So for me, I was like, okay, great, I can do this. Um, and I loved every moment of it, especially during the summertime as a student. You know, you get to work more hours, see more, get engaged more. Um, but then higher education kind of snuck right in there towards it. Um, I was never supposed to be in higher education because I'm a first-generation college student. And so for me, I was looking at okay, I've got this degree, how do I get out there, get a good job, support my family, contribute back to my community? I see. Tell me a little more about that technical school with the hotel built into that. Yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, it's called Garrett Academy of Technology in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, and that's and where you're so from, right? That's where I'm from. Okay. I love Charleston. I will talk about it all day long. <laughs> so if you want to learn about Charleston, come by my office, which is located in the Student Union Building on the second floor. Um, I will have things in my office about Charleston, books and trinkets oh, and whatnot. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Um, but Garrett Academy is a technical high school, ninth, ninth through you know twelfth grade, um, and students can learn culinary, marketing, hospitality, um, auto shop, masonry, that kind of stuff. So the the the, this, the high school is designed for you to kind of get a trade underneath your belt because if you don't want to go to college, you've got a starting place through high school. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's really... Yeah. It was really awesome to be a part of that experience. Right. So t tell me how, how the higher education snuck up on you. Yeah. So because I was so involved as a student um, through SGA and Residence Hall Association and other commitments, um, my vice chancellor of student affairs said, hey, you, you're very heavily involved in campus life. Have you ever thought about a master's degree in student affairs? And I was like, no. Like in my family, I am, you know, there's not a lot of us that have, you know, higher ed degrees or even college degrees in general. So when I thought about what it would mean to my family to be the first person on both my mom and my diet side to have a master's degree, I was like, why not? You know, I love higher education. I love the work that I've been doing. It's just part of the exploratory process to see, well, what more can I do? And then you got your doctorate. Yeah. Yeah. So while I was working at Shenandoah University, um, well, I well. Before then, well, at Colgate University, I had a, a mentor, um, Dr. Scott Brown. He was talking to me about his experience in, in higher education and what it was like to go get his Ph.D. And I was like, there's no way I can get a Ph.D. I'm not smart enough for that kind of work. And I don't have the time or the energy. But learning about his experiences and him being a mentor for me through the whole process um, is where I was like, OK, let's just give it a shot. Um, but I wasn't ready to apply at that point. So I was still at Colgate, um, but I knew I wanted to kind of go to that next level in my career and my life. So I said, okay, eventually I will get a doctorate degree, but I won't think about it right now. It wasn't until I got a job at Shenandoah University that through the mentors I had there and the friends I had there, I was like, okay, you're going to pay for me to go back to school. Why not? Free education. You can't turn that down. So oh. got enrolled, found my purpose, found my passion, um, and, and didn't look back. And how was it? Was it your ex expectations that you weren't smart enough? <laughs> you know, and, and that's just it though, is, you know, for me with both my master's and my doctorate, cause I got to focus so much on what I was passionate about. I had professors and colleagues who were right there pushing me along saying, of course you can do this. Mm -hmm. You know, like think about what you're passionate about and think about the knowledge you're getting because of that and just how to apply it. Um, and when you work in a cohort model, a cohort model where you have colleagues who are right there in education with you, um, who are fighting the same fight, who are advocating the same way you're advocating. It just makes it easier, you know, cause they're learning right alongside you. And so if you don't understand something, you turn to your colleagues in the classroom and say, Hey, I don't get this. Do you? And, um, I had very supportive colleagues to help kind of 
educate me along the way and on the path. And it was just such a very supportive process. So that feeling of, oh, I can't do this quickly went away because they didn't make me feel, you know, less than they made me feel like, of course, you've got this, you understand it. I just need to say it in a different way to connect to your brain. Right. They believed in you. Oh, yeah. Very much so. Right. And I think that's something everyone has to remember oh, yeah. because everyone has problems believing in themselves, right? Oh, that's yeah. just the human experience. Oh, yeah. But if you have people surrounding you that care. Yes. And push you, you know, the minute you want to give up. I mean, some of my friends, there's been times when I'm like, okay, I just can't do this. I am tired. I'm done. Just let me walk away be done and they were like no look at how far you've come look at how much you've learned look at how much you've contributed like why would you give that up and so I almost didn't complete my doctorate because I was in year five at the time it took me seven years Wow! and typically it takes it's supposed to take four to five um, but I worked full-time so it's very hard to go of to course. school full-time and get your degree full-time um, and the work that I was doing was very 60-hour work week um, but folks around me said listen you put a lot, you put a lot of time, energy, heart, and skill in this. Don't back down. And yes, it took you longer than other folks, but your journey is different than everybody else's. So don't measure yourself about how everyone else is doing. This is your path. This is your story. Stick with it. And that is so important to remember. Very important. We always compare ourselves to everybody yeah, else. Yeah, it's like, oh, well, look at person X over there. Look at what they have. Look at how they're doing. And you're like, but that's their journey. That's their story. You've got your own. Exactly. What are some challenges? I mean, you talked about your, your full-time job, you know, during your doctorate. Yeah. But what other challenges did you face as a student, and how did you overcome them? Yeah, I, I think being financially stable through that whole process is, yes, you're working full-time, and yes, you've got, you know, other things going on. But I, I think being financially sound and secure in this whole process uh, was its own challenge. Um, I think understanding um, kind of my value and worth as a person of color in some of these spaces um, was its own challenge because I didn't feel as though I competed or compared myself well enough to meet the same expectations as everybody else in the classroom. Um, and so I had to push myself even further to say, no, I do belong here. Yes, I am valued. Yes, I am capable of meeting the educational requirements and standards. Um, so I, I did a lot of self-loathing throughout that whole process. And I think my own confidence needed to be uh, change and alter to think differently about who I, how I saw myself in this whole process. So between the finances and the self-worth, um, I think those are my two biggest things as a student I struggled with. So if students now are struggling with those things, you'll be able to help oh, them. Oh yeah, I'm ready. I am super ready. Because again, all it takes is for somebody to believe in you and to show you the things that you've done so you can believe in yourself. Because people do a lot. People contribute a lot of themselves to a process, to a school, to a, a whatever. And then they don't think back to reflect on it and say, I am doing something, you know. And I need to value even those small wins. I mean, just applying to college is a huge win. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. you think about you got to take the SAT, the ACT, the GRE, the whatever the test might be. You got to get good grades. And, and, and sometimes, you know, there's a system that says you got to have all these things before we will look at you. And it's like, well, do you really need all those things? You know, like there are some basic requirements to getting into college that we all need. But I think we talk ourselves out of certain spaces because, oh, well, in high school, I wasn't as involved or my grades would not be as high. And it's like, no, no, no. Apply. The right school will see and value you. And that's where you belong. What, did, what more advice do you have as we come back? I mean, hopefully people will look at the self-worth. Yes. Self-worth is the number one thing. And, and self-care. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for me, I make sure that I make time for friends and family. Um, yes, I've got school. I've got work. I've got this. I've got that. Um, but the people who love you, who support you, um, who care about your success, they're going to be there. They're going to uplift you. Um, so don't you know, forget to make a phone call. Um, I think one thing the pandemic has taught us all is to use technology more. Um, so those friends that live far away, why can't you video chat them? You know, I mean, most of my friends, um, we all have iPhones, so we can FaceTime, you know, so we don't need some third party app to, you know, connect us all together. But sometimes it's a phone call. I got friends in California that I've had to learn to do more calls with. Yes, it's not the same as uh, physically being in community with somebody. But 
a lot of my nights I've been able to get some good advice over the phone or get out of my own headspace and listen to somebody else and what good things are going on in their life, a new job, family changes, um, something they, they made or done. I had a fraternity brother um, who got into woodworking and he started making cutting boards cool. um, over the summer. And it was such a, like, I'm not a crafts person whatsoever, um, but watching other people do crafts and paint and all that kind of stuff, it just takes you out of your own headspace. So making time to celebrate their wins and appreciate what they're doing um, is, is a part of that self-care. Connecting with friends and family is so critical. It is. What other self-care techniques do you use for yourself? Yeah. Um, so for me, I love going to my barber shop. Really? Um, yes, yes. When you are sitting in that barber chair and oh. he's cutting your hair and giving you that facial trim and that hot towel, um, that's part of my process. I will always make sure every two weeks I am in my barber's chair. That is my self-care time. That is my me time. Um, and a good conversation with, with a good barber goes a long way, too. Um, because the, you, you just feel different about yourself too. So me and the barber, we have our every two week appointment. Um, other times, whenever I have friends in, in time, I'll go to the spa, you know, Manny Petties, love it. Love really? it. Yes. I love me some Manny Petties. <laughs> so I will go get in the chair, yeah. put my foot in the water, let it soak, let the chair do this massage thing. Yeah. Um, and the Manny Petty haircut moment, spa day. <laughs> you know? Spa day. And I, and I, I think, you know, for me, what I've appreciated is more and more people are doing it. Um, you find the right place for the right price or you save up for it. You know, I mean, as a college student, you're not going to have a chance to go every time to get manis and petties. Um, but I think if you just make it that one special treat of a semester for yourself or some friends, it's a big deal. A lot mm. of self-care, a lot of self-care. Um, so between self-care and care with community, that's what I'm looking forward to in 2021 and beyond. I'm so excited. <laughs> wow. So tell me a little bit about um, growing up. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious because you grew up in Charleston. Yeah, I want to hear I a little did. more about Charleston yeah. um, and, and just your experiences and how it shaped you as a person. Yeah. So I come from a very um, well religious centered family. Um, I, I consider myself to be more spiritual because I like learning from different you know, denominations and religious groups um, to kind of find that good and that centered purpose of life and, 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 and well-being. Um, so being in Charleston, um, it's a beautiful city. Um, you can learn, you can see and learn a lot about the historical culture down there, the military culture, um, architecture. Um, there's like this four points of law and, and, and religion down there that you can kind of see and do. Um, riding on the trolleys in that area, um, horse-drawn carriages. I mean, it really is a Southern hospitality kind of experience down there. And so I tell everybody, if you're going to go, you got to stay in downtown Charleston. You got to walk everywhere because you can see everything, you know, in walking distance to, to the shops and restaurants and just the culture um, that's down there. Um, but that shaped me as a, as a person um, just because it was – Southern hospitality is always about service to others and creating, you know, experiences that are uh, designed for care, that are designed for community building. Um, and so I think that's why I love the hospitality industry so much um, and how that relates also to higher education is because it's about caring for others, too, and that whole process. And so um, I love being from Charleston, South Carolina. I love talking about it and when people go to visit for vacations, I'm like, okay, here are the top like three or four things you should do while you're down there. Um, and, and again, it's all about when you're in that space, again, you're practicing self-care, getting away. You're enjoying a scene. You're learning culture along the way too. It's so interesting, the self-care mm -hmm. and then the service to others. Yes. yes. That, that duality there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it can be done. I, I think, again, it always starts with self. If you take care of yourself, then you can kind of work to take care of others too and help others take care of themselves too. What plans do you have for the fall as we come back? And you'll be here for the first semester. I will be. Um, so I think for me is um, it's about getting to know students, figuring out where the hot spots are, where, where people hang out. So you're, I'm going to see you wandering around the campus? You will see me. <laughs> and, uh, now, don't be confused because sometimes it may be just me being lost, you know? So if you do see me looking lost, just say, okay, where, where are you trying to go? Um, but yeah, I, I really want to find spaces uh, where students hang out. Um, but also I want to show people spaces that they may not be aware of. 
um, like the new student union building that's opened. Um, a lot of folks haven't had a chance to hang out there because of COVID. And so I want to bring people to that space. I want to bring people back to the student activity center and say, hey, this is student centered spaces. Um, so use it, get engaged with it. Um, and I want to hear how students, you know, can help improve it throughout the time. Um, I want to imp improve, you know, campus pride and spirit along the way. Um, so I'm looking to see what it looks like and how we can improve it. So a lot of just learning about the culture and learning about students and what they're passionate about and how student affairs can help, you know, create those spaces and places to do that. So you won't be locked away in your office. If people find me in my office, it's meaning because we're sitting there chit-chatting. I will always have <laughs> snacks in my office oh, because it's a great way to, you know, yeah. it's, it's kind of like breaking bread in the South. You know, you have a cup oh. of coffee or you have some candies or snacks or whatever. So we're in my office is because it's probably too hot outside. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, I hope to be in a lot of different spaces where students are. Yeah. Have you met any students since you've been here? Yeah, just a few. A very small amount, a handful of students who are on campus working. Um, athletes, um, folks in different parts of the campus and, and, and different majors. Um, and just, you know, picking their brain. You know, What do they like about campus? And, you know, what are they looking forward to? And everybody's general theme is just being in community. Wow. So if they're open to community, then I know that's my end to say, okay, let's go hang out and just talk shop and, you know celebrate the fact that we're all back and in person and, you know, can, can rebuild community again. A huge mission of student affairs, I believe, is a sense of belonging. Yes, yes. How do you hope to achieve this with your students? Yeah, I think it all starts with everything being student-driven, you know. Okay. Um, students have to decide what does it look like for the culture to create um, spaces for people to belong. Um, students have to give us ideas on what it means to connect um, not just th through programs, but through services that we offer. Um, when you walk into an office, are people giving you a warm, welcome greeting? You know, so you know, hey, we're glad you're here. Mm -hmm. you know, no matter what office you walk in, you should feel like, yep, they're ready to help me. They're w it's a warm greeting, a warm invitation to be in that space. Um, but also, we, we got to design spaces for folks just to hang out in, you know, um, to make it their own, to do what they need to do, um, whether you're, you know, in a dance competition um, and you're practicing in the hallway of the student union building or you're hosting a meeting or an event. Like, how are the physical spaces designed um, for students to engage and to connect with one another? Um, and I think the other part for a sense of belonging is that pride and what does it mean to be a seawolf? You know, like defining it for people and then, you know, just showing up and being present. Um, I'm going to attend as many events as, as I'm invited to um, just because I want to make sure that students know that I am an advocate for students and their well-being. But I'm also here to help create environments that they want to live in and work and play in. That's fantastic. So we know that you're going to be attending the events. Mm -hmm. You're going to be wandering around, oh, yeah. making rela relationships and connections with the students. How do you plan to execute those changes? Yeah, um, a, a lot of it starts with meeting with student leaders, you know, okay. going to the club meetings and saying, hey, this is who I am. How can I help? Um, a lot of it is listening to what students are working on. What are they excited for um, and asking for help? You know, um, a lot of it is there are things that students can do um, to kind of create that culture and create that sense of belonging. And then where it it needs to transition into other offices and, and other staff members getting involved, connecting people to one another um, to make sure that we provide that care, provide that resource. Um, so if I'm talking to a group of students and they've got a great idea, if it's in the Dean of Students, Student Affairs realm to do, we're going to work together to do it. Um, if it's outside of you know my purview and, and area, it's like, okay, how do I connect those students to that area and how do we advocate and work collaboratively along the way to make that happen? Or if it can't happen, you know, let's talk through reasons why that can't happen. You know, what's the impact to not being able to do something? And if we do do something, what's that impact as well? So got to look at both coins and both sides of the coin to determine, like, what's the best fit for the collective community? It's all about com communication. Oh, yeah. Communication and collaboration for sure. Right. You know, because, um, I mean, we all have great ideas. We all want to see things happen. We all want to build community. Um, some things we've got resources to do them. Um, we've got great people around us to help us make things come um, to light. And, and, and when we're challenged by things that we can't do, what's next? You know? So you work with the students. Directly. Directly. Yeah. But also faculty and staff play a huge role, right? They really do. They really do. Um, and and I, th I think faculty and staff play a huge role in that self-care as well. 
Um, you know, we all have things outside the classroom with family and friends back home. Uh, we have our own personal moments in life. And so I think when we struggle through things, how can faculty and staff be a resource for us, um, providing the right level of care? Uh, we've got a great food pantry on campus um, to provide resources for students. We have got the counseling and health centers um, on campus to provide that kind of care and support. Um, you know, we have residence halls where they're looking to build community among those individuals. Um, we've got our community student programs, graduate student programs. I mean, there's so many student groups, so many student programs around us. Um, it's like, okay, where can students go to get that right resource? And what faculty and staff are invested in that process and invested in those resources to help supplement where it needs to be supplemented. And then also getting the faculty and staff to support the students. Well, yeah. Not only support it, but also be in community. Right. You know, um, attending those programs, attending those events, um, giving giving feedback, you know, um, to how we're shaping culture and community. Um, one of the things that a couple of colleagues and I were talking about is how do we get everybody to wear red on Friday? And mm. I think it starts with if faculty and staff are wearing red on Friday to show that kind of school spirit and pride. And, and then, you know, being able to, like, give out free pizzas and free T-shirts and just other ways to kind of get folks hyped up about campus life, too. So creating that kind of sense of pride and, 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 and spirit about Stony Brook. Right, having the faculty and staff set an example. Yes, set the example, participate in that whole process, um, and, and also um, listen to students' ideas. So that way, anything new that wants to be created gets created. Not everything has to come from one avenue or one area. I think it can be a collective approach. And I also think, setting by example, faculty and staff need to be smiling, mm -hmm. and they need to be yes. happy to be here. I, I spoke to Rick Gatto. Yeah. Uh, he was also on the podcast, and, and he was saying things cannot be taken for granted. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we can't have regrets. We can't. We have to enjoy being here. And I think COVID, although the horrific challenges that it brought, brought a silver lining too. That, yes. That we're here. Yes. We're here. We're not yes. on Zoom. We're here. Yes. Very true. Very true. And you're, he, he's, he's exactly right is, you know, a lot of us were disconnected for quite some time, you know, um, and many of us miss being in community. And I'm typically in my personal life, I'm very introverted. You know, I, I got to be. Uh, alone to kind of recharge. Except when you're with your barber. Except when I'm with, with the <laughs> barber. Um, but I recharge, you know, through my own time. Um, but I give that energy back when I'm engaging with students and engaging with colleagues. Um, and so even I, as somebody, as an introvert as, as, as I am, I miss being in community with, with students, faculty, and staff, mostly students, um, because uh, that environment is just such a high-energy environment to be in, and I love it, and I miss it. Um, and the thing is, I took it for granted. You know, I'm like, oh, you know, I'll catch the next program, or I'll catch up with that next activity or whatever, or we'll, we'll, we'll connect in some other way. And now that it was all taken away, I was like, oh, God, I miss it. Mm -hmm. you know? um, so he's right. You, you can't take it for granted, and you got to live in the moment. Um, and you got to appreciate everything, too. I heard from a few fellow students, and I told Rick this. They hated lectures. They wouldn't go. They refused to go. They just couldn't stand them. And then once COVID began and everything was on Zoom, they couldn't wait to get back to the lecture. <laughs> so it's, it's this sense of perspective. Yes, yes. Very true. Very true. Yeah, yeah. Well... Thank you so much, Rick. Thank you for having we me. We have two Ricks now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, for me, it's like, okay, when everybody is happy and excited, it's Rick McClendon, okay? I'm the good cop of the group. So everything else, is not my, it's, it's, I'm, I'm blaming it all on him. On Rick Gatto. Yeah, yeah. No, no. But, we, you know, that's the great thing about our partnership um, is we're both so eager to be in places and spaces uh, where we get to advocate for students and support students. Um, and I've heard both Rick uh, Gatell and President McGinnis talk about how do we create that sense of belonging for campus and community. Um, and I'm just excited to be a part of the team to help uh, collaborate with other colleagues and students and faculty and staff to kind of just create that. Um, I'm just so eager to be um, with everybody this uh, fall. Um, and even though I don't start till July 12th, I've kind of used some of my time here just to kind of connect and engage with anybody who's around for the summer, just so I can get my feet wet and understand, like, what is the spirit of Stony Brook? What are people excited for for this fall? Um, and I can use that to kind of help shape things as we move forward. 
Of course. And for listeners who don't know, Rick Gatto's role is? He's the vice president for student affairs. So he oversees uh, my unit of, of the dean of students office, uh, career development, uh, campus residences, and student health, wellness, and prevention. And how do you differ? What's your role? Uh, so I, I focus uh, a lot of the on the co-curricular stuff, out of the, out of the, out of the classroom experiences, um, spaces like the student union um, buildings, student activities, um, clubs and organizations. Um, you know, we're looking at diversity and inclusion programming, um, LGBTQ services, student support um, is also an, an area of mine, um, and. Uh, student centers um, is also part of that process. So for me, it's all about the all the out of the classroom experiences. How do you want to engage in campus life? How do you want to build community? Um, where can we support those needs? And if students need support and want to talk to you, yeah, all they have to do is one stop by the student union building. Um, I'm on the second floor in the student life offices. Uh, they can find me on Instagram. Uh, my handle is SBU Dean of Students. And so they can message me on that. Happy to talk to folks there. Um, my email at some point will be live, I think, this week or next week. Um, so the email isn't live yet. But right now, it's either come talk in person, and I love in-person visits, um, or they can catch me on the Instagram app. And your email is just your name, right? I think so. <laughs> I think so. Um, it, again, emailing me is also a great way. Um, to connect and, and we're going to do some promotions around that to get that, to get my name and email and, and contacts out there just so students can be aware and kind of engage. Great. Well, thank you again, Rick. I, I'm glad to I be here. Really thank you. I really enjoyed this. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Oh, you too. I'm this hot one. <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm going I'm to do my best not to uh, melt while I'm out there, but not as hot as Charleston. No, no, not at all. Not at all. It, again, the weather in Charleston is still beautiful. Uh, my favorite time of the year is fall. I love the fall in Charleston, um, but it'll work out. It'll work out. Thanks Thank again. You.